Hello everyone, I'm Dean Blevins and welcome to this week's Eddie Sutton Show. Since we last met, Oklahoma State on the road wins two more games. Record still perfect, 19-0. Coach, you're number three in America. Good chance of moving up. Way to go. We didn't play as well this week as we did in our victory over the Sooners last week, but we had two non-conference games. We opened with a, a win over ORU last Saturday evening over in Tulsa. Sellout crowd, outstanding uh, enthusiasm on the part of all of our people, half of them we're ORU people, but a great setting for college basketball. Then on to uh, SMU to play in one of my favorite arenas in this part of the country, Moody Coliseum. I've taken the Razorbacks there 11 straight times, and it's just a large Gallagher Ive arena, and they're also, uh, they had the biggest crowd that they've had there for several years, 8,100 people, and over half of them were Oklahoma State people, and we won that ball game. So now we're back to the real world. We got to play Missouri here Sunday afternoon, and the rest of our games are all Big 8 are all Big 8 games. Coach, a lot has been made of the fact that you have you won every non-conference game this season and that makes the only only the third Big 8 team ever to do that. There have been a lot of good Big 8 teams and this is only the third team in history to get it done. Well, that's a real credit to our basketball team and uh, that was one of the goals that our seniors certainly wanted. Once they realized that uh, they had a chance, I think they focused in quite well. Uh, I'm uh, like you, it seems uh, unusual with all the great basketball teams that the Big 8 has had only twice before has that ever happened. I think Missouri did it one year and the University of Kansas did it uh, recently. All right, stay with us. When we come back, we'll have highlights of the win at ORU and at SMU and a lot more on this week's Eddie Sutton Show. 17-0, Oklahoma State headed to Tulsa to play Oral Roberts at the Maybe Center. And Coach, you were looking to keep that non-conference win streak alive, and you did it. It's up to seven straight non-conference wins on the road now. What people uh, forget uh, when you're playing a non-conference game uh, and you're ranked, uh, those teams are going to come after you. And Ken Tricky uh, has a very talented ball club, a team that hasn't won maybe as many as they thought they would, but a nice, nice club. And we did what you have to do. And there's Sean hitting a three-point shot, and, and this is early in the game. You want to jump out on people and put them down before they ever have a chance and ever think they have a, an opportunity to beat you. And we jumped out 22 to four in the early going. There's Corey Williams hitting a very deep three-point shot. Great shot of Pistol Pete. Corey Williams has put up 265 threes in his career. That's an OSU record. Well, Corey that Williams, strong there, huh? Corey, that's a strong move. I was watching that. Milt Brown. It was a good lead pass by Sean, but he took the ball to the glass. A lot of times when you get there and you're under pressure, you'll float a little bit, but he didn't do that. Byron Houston led a ball club with 30 points. Uh, the guy that uh, probably played the best he'd played for a long time, however, was Bryant Reeves. He had 21 points and also pulled down eight rebounds. Reeves has shot 71% from the field the last two games, averaging 15 and a half for those two. A great follow shot by number four, uh, Binky uh, Triplett. We got to play uh, Pell and Triplett. And oh. was nice behind the back pass by Cornell Hatcher. You let them do that, Coach? Oh, if, they, if they're successful, <laughs> they won't hear about it. How quick will they sit down if they mess gone. up on that play, now they may be one of the next to me. But in a game like this, we got ahead and we lost a little bit of intensity and uh, we were able to play a lot of the younger players and we ended up winning, winning a ball game 84 to 61. Here's a good shot, good power move, nice lead pass into the pivot area and uh, Reeves drove it home. You played at Tulsa earlier in the year and I know you've talked often and uh, and with good reason about wanting to play in Tulsa. Well, one of the best arenas in this part of the country is Maybe Center, mm -hmm. and uh, we have such a strong alumni base in the Tulsa area and also Eastern Oklahoma, and I think our fans thoroughly enjoyed the game, and we hope to go back next year and play again. Oklahoma State wins it 84-61. to That's 18-0, and and then next down to Moody Coliseum where you mentioned you've taken a lot of good Arkansas teams, and a lot of folks showed up 8,100 for that one. I think all of us were surprised by the number of people that did to show up. Uh, half of them supporting OSU. At least half. I, I think we had over half the crowd. Uh, one thing before we leave, you touched on uh, taking our ball club off campus. I hope in the, in the near future we can go to Oklahoma City because there are a lot of people in western Oklahoma, southern Oklahoma, uh, that would like to see our team play, and with the size of Gallagher Iva, it's an impossibility. So we'll uh, look forward to coming to Oklahoma City and, and bringing the Cowboys maybe next year or the following year. All right, myriad people, I think he's talking to you. Let's go back to tape and watch Oklahoma State playing at SMU in Moody Coliseum. The score, say, score SMU surprised us by coming out in a zone. They hadn't played zone, and it was a very slow tempo, which they wanted. 
and we had a difficult time hitting the outside shot. Sean hit that one. He was three out of eight from three-point range, but uh, Coy went zero for nine, and Darwin was only uh, three out of eight. And if you can't hit that perimeter shot against the zone, then you're asking for problems. And uh, so they hung in the ball game. Good pass there by Brian Reeves off to Cornell Hatcher. That's what you call going high-low against the zone. Good defense again, Hatcher with the basketball. Good pass to Randy Davis. Randy, I felt, played the best that he had played in a while, and he had 12 points in this ball game. We were led by Byron with 17. Darwin Alexander with a three over there deep in the corner. Halftime was 28 to 22, so the ponies hung with us pretty, pretty good. Coach, you made an 11-2 run toward the end of the half. You all have had an excellent uh, season of making runs when you need them, late at the half and late in games. Well, I hope that continues because from now on, all the games are going to be tough, uh, starting with Missouri Sunday afternoon. There's a shot of the crowd, and we come out to begin the second half, and uh, good defense. This is what fans like to see, that alley-oop pass, and... Davis is a very good catcher. You can be a good passer, but if you don't have a guy at the other end, that play's not going to work. Randy, I think, uh, is second in dunks with, on our basketball team next to Byron. There's Randy with a little turnaround jump shot. Byron's in the game now, but this is another ball game where he picked up three early fouls and had to sit down. He was out of the ball game for quite some time, and some of our other guys picked up the slack. Sean with a long three-pointer. What range does Sean have? 19 nines the line. He was well yeah. behind that. Not, uh, not a great distance behind that line, but he's, he's one of our best three-point shooters. He had seven assists to lead a ball club in that category. We out-rebounded uh, ORU, but in this particular game, we were out-rebounded by four. SMU's a big basketball team. They're uh, about in the middle of the pack in the Southwest Conference, but like I said, it's a big game for someone like SMU to play us because to upset us would uh, make national headlines and help their program. Good pass, that's what you call good inside passing once inside the zone. Mike Alexander and his wife, a couple of great fans of ours who uh, drove down or flew down from Ponca City for the game. So the Cowboys go to 19-0, and and Coach, we won't fool anyone. We're taping this program before the Duke game tonight, so if Duke loses, you will be number one, but UCLA loses, so you're looking at number two. Those rankings are for the fans, Dean. If we're up there high at the end of the season, I'll be pleased, but right now, uh, that's the least of our worries. The Tigers are our number one concern, but I was surprised that uh, the University of Southern California, a good friend of mine, George Raveling, coaches the Trojans. They beat the uh, Bruins, and that was in Poly Pavilion, so that was a major upset. And as you mentioned, uh, there is a game being played in Tallahassee this evening between Florida State and Duke, but uh, something will have to be wrong with Duke, not, not taking anything away from Florida State. Duke is the best. There's no one even close to them right now in college basketball. Well, I hope tonight when we see this uh, played that we can say, well, we were wrong on that one. Uh, last that doesn't mean they can't get beat. That's right. Because that's, right. that's what makes basketball a great game. But uh, it'll take a remarkable perfor performance on the part of the other ball club. Plus, I think Duke's going to have to be down a little bit that particular evening. To finish the non-conference thoughts, was there concern going into the SMU game that you had to have your team up because it's a, it's a team you were, you were favored to handle by, I believe, 15 points? Dean, I'm always uh, concerned uh, when you play non-conference games within a co uh, conference schedule. And I'm always concerned when you're a heavy favorite like we were. Uh, young people read the newspaper like everyone else, but they also are mature enough to realize that a team like SMU is capable of beating us if we're not really focused in. And our team did a pretty good job in that area. You know, the Big 8 non-conference slate is over. Remarkable uh, record. Uh, the Big 8 teams won 97 times, lost 13, percentage 882, the best that the Big 8 has ever had in, against non-conference opponents. And best in the country, ACC, a, a distant second. We'll take a break. When we come back, we have Coach's Corner and the Play of the Week, that and more after this. This week's play of the week, early second half at SMU, Coach. We saw this play a little bit earlier. Our defense gets us a basketball. Sean looks up the floor. Good pass to Randy Davis. That's why we always tell our players, run that floor hard. You may have a surprise when you get there. And that was a great pass. And uh, as I said, uh, people like to see lob passes and guys that can catch that basketball and flush it uh, down through the net. I hope one of these days that we have a last second shot that beats the Jayhawks or Missouri <laughs> or Oklahoma because that will be 
the uh, play of the week. But uh, this was good. A very brief break. We'll come right back to Coach's Corner. Stay with us. Coach's Corner this week, a little unusual. It uh, involves a lane violation late in the game down in Dallas against SMU. Coach, that play really course. didn't amount to anything because the game was already pretty much uh, determined. But it's an unusual play, and that's why I wanted to show the fans. There's uh, Randy Davis rebounding uh, the basketball on a missed shot. Here it is again. Uh, I'm like not a bad sure he call. fouled. Yeah, call it, was a, it, was a, 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 it was a call that I think we <laughs> might uh, uh, question. But here's the play. You saw that young man run in there, and we're going to see it again here. And I call timeout. This is a correctable error. What happened was the young man ran from outside the circle into the lane before the ball hit the rim. That's a violation. In the NBA, you can do that. Last year in the playoffs, Michael Jordan did that and won a game for them. And I'm trying to explain this to the officials, and they said, well, you didn't see it. And I said, I don't see how three officials couldn't have seen that play. But, and I'm pointing to them, and, and as I said, we've already won the game because we're up, I think, 10 points, and there's less than a minute to go. But I'm trying to get my point across that that's why it's important late in the game for officials really to be aware of what's going on because if they make a mistake and it's a close game, you have no time to recover from that. Let's see that ball I should have shown. There's the young man. He ran from outside the lane. There, we're going to run it back. I freeze it right there. You can see he's definitely already in the lane. You can see that I'm not very good with this point. I like that. Huh? There's, the, there's the basketball <laughs> that hadn't hit the uh, rim yet. Uh -huh. So that is a violation, and what should have happened, the officials should have waved that off, taken the free throw away. The, uh, it was a one-on-one -on -one situation, so the shooter would not have been allowed to shoot the second shot. We would have had the ball out of bounds. So uh, very unusual play. You don't see that happen very often. A play similar to that happened the other night in the Oklahoma-Nebraska game where the shooter... Uh, the rule says that if you're along the lane, you can get into the lane as soon as the shooter releases a basketball. Right. If you're the shooter, you can't get into the lane until the ball hits the iron. And one of Nebraska's shooters shot the ball, crossed the line before the ball hit the rim, and the official caught it and disallowed the, the point and gave the ball to the Sooners out of bounds. So, very unusual play. Instant replay would have corrected that. How about some isolated instant replay in basketball? Well, you know, they can do that in NCAA playoffs. Last year when we played Temple, I That's tried true. to get them to go over and look at the, uh, at the film because they, too, made a mistake. They allowed a man to shoot a free throw, and he wasn't the one that should have been shooting it. But uh, the officials overruled me on that one as well as they did here. But uh, instant replay would be good. What a big ball game coming up on Sunday. Let's turn our attention to Missouri. Missouri has beaten Oklahoma State 13 of 16 times. They are holding opponents to 39%. That's the pro-Missouri stuff. I'm sure you're ready and loaded for bear, though. Well, at this point, we have uh, two more practice sessions, and uh, we'll practice Friday and Saturday. Missouri, in my opinion, and in the opinion of a lot of people, probably is as good a basketball team as we have in the Big 8. Uh, when you look at uh, Missouri, Kansas, uh, Oklahoma and Oklahoma State, very little difference. And then there's very little drop-off when you go to Iowa State and Nebraska and Colorado and K-State. But the four teams I mentioned at first, they're all good basketball teams. Missouri has a great player in Peeler, maybe the best guard that we have in college basketball. And they've got, he's got a great, recruit, or a great uh, uh, group of people that he surrounds himself with. Uh, Missouri has won the more games on the road that are really prestigious wins for them. They went to Barnhill and beat Arkansas, and I think that told everybody that they're for real. They went to Notre Dame and won. They went to Nebraska and they won. They would have probably beaten the Jayhawks at home, one of their two losses, had they had Warren. Jeff Warren was not in, the, in that particular game. He was out, and that really hurt them. Uh, they lost the other game at Memphis State. Our team knows that the University of Missouri is, a, is an outstanding basketball team. It should be a great setting s Sunday afternoon when we entertain the, entertain the Tigers. Coach, we'll take a look at the Big 8 standings and the schedule coming up this week and talk more Missouri coming up after this. As Coach Sutton mentioned earlier in the program, the Big 8 leads all conferences in America in non-conference wins. Coach, 88%. Let's take a look at the standings of the Big 8 Conference. Oklahoma State on top, Kansas 3-0 perfect behind you. Kansas has a tough game uh, Saturday afternoon down in Norman. I think everybody in the league is going to be rooting for the Sooners to win that ball game because Kansas already has two uh, road victories. Very surprising this early in the race, Dean. Uh, 13 conference games have been played. Seven teams have gone on the road to win. I don't think that percentage will hold up the rest of the year. 
and in terms of the schedule, uh, of course, the big one is Oklahoma State hosting Missouri this coming week. Let's take a look, though. There are some other games in the Big 8 Conference this coming week. Saturday the 1st, Colorado at K-State. Kansas at Oklahoma is a big one. I know you'll be looking at that one. We certainly will. Iowa State and Nebraska, they're all big because at this point, uh, no one's out of the league race. Monday or Sunday, our game, and then Monday, K-State goes to Kansas, which is always a, a big uh, interstate rivalry. We travel on to uh, Nebraska Wednesday evening to play the Cornhuskers. Oklahoma goes to Boulder, and Iowa State is at Columbia to play the Tigers. Always uh, the next game is your biggest, but this has to be the biggest week for you thus far. You better play them one at a time. This game uh, on uh, Sunday probably is the biggest game that has been played uh, in Stillwater in many, many years because I don't think that it's uh, you've had two nationally ranked teams. Oklahoma State has not been in the top ten very often. And, of course, uh, you have Missouri coming in. I've never seen so many media people requesting uh, an opportunity to come there or the pro scouts or just fans. I have no tickets, so don't be calling <laughs> our, our athletic department for any tickets. Time now to continue our series on the history of basketball and a real special one tonight talking about the evolution of the ball itself. Those are always fun pieces. Coach, things have gone uh, as well as they could have gone for you and your team this year. Have you ever had more fun coaching? Dean, I don't believe I've ever had uh, a season in, that I've enjoyed anymore. I've never been 19-0 uh, uh, and zero and been undefeated up through the month of January. Uh, so any coach would be pleased with that. But when you say have fun, uh, I think uh, the fact that we have such wonderful young men to work with Last year we had a great ball club. This year it's an outstanding team. And it's a lot of fun to go over there and teach them every day and be with them and travel with them because they are quality people. They represent our school in a, in a class manner. And the other thing that's been thrilling for me is to uh, have my son uh, there every day and have him uh, a part of building this program back to the, the day that uh, it once was when Mr. Ivo was coaching here. So, yes, I'm having a lot of fun. How hard is it to go undefeated? Duke, before this taping, was undefeated, and of course you all. I don't believe anyone's going to go through the season undefeated, uh, even Duke. Uh, I'll be very surprised if uh, they don't stub their toe along the way. They got some tough road trips, and there'll be a night where they don't shoot it well, or someone will be ill, one of their key players. So uh, I don't think you're going to find anyone that uh, is going to go through college basketball any more undefeated. It could happen. And, uh, but I'll be surprised. All right, Coach, best of luck. Uh, tip off 253, pulling for you on Saturday, well, or on Sunday. Sunday afternoon. It'll be a great, uh, great ball game. And that ball game can be seen on ABC television. Thank you for watching this week's Eddie Sutton Show. I'm Dean Blevins. See you next week, same time, same place. <laughs>